We are back and live in the house, Red Emma's family. Once again, good evening. We're so glad to see you. I am the poet known as Analysis, and on behalf of the entire Red Emma's Bookstore Coffee House Collective, we appreciate your coming out this evening. Uh, it's, it's not nice this evening. It's kind of kind of wet, kind of damp and chill. So I understand that it was a temptation to just stay on the sofa or somewhere else, but you came out the house, decided to join us and be in community, and that is exactly what we are about here at Emma's, uh, building the type of networks and communities that we need to. So uh, some of you may not even know that there was an event this evening and are kind of getting roped into it, but in a good way, I hope, so that we do invite you to kind of uh, keep, keep uh, conversations down to a minimum. Uh, and you are welcome if you need to step outside to take a call or something uh, or step in the back. You're certainly welcome to do that. We might ask you to mute your electronic devices during the event. How many of you are visiting Red Emma's for the very first time at any of our locations? But, but there's a few, well, fantastic, well, welcome. Uh, so glad that you found us and you're here, so now you're part of the Red Emma's fam. And we want you to come back uh, very often. This is our new location that we opened in the fall. We uh, are very excited because this is the first time we have purchased the buildings. And so uh, this building, thank you. This that runs all the way back, as you see, back toward the kitchen. And this building also that runs along 32nd Street uh, is also ours. And in a couple months after we finish renovating it and moving all the books upstairs into it, that is going to be our beautiful new bookstore, uh, wonderful two-level space. And that is going to be very, very nice. So keep that in mind. When we do that, it will be the return of something some of you are familiar with from our North Avenue location called the Baltimore Free School Classroom. And so you keep in mind uh, for a workshop that you may want to offer or your rad left organization staff meeting or something like that. There are all kinds of things that happen here. First, I want to again remind you that there are two restrooms up the ramp and to the left. You certainly are welcome and encouraged to get food during the event uh, and something to drink. Maybe not so many lattes because they make noise and we're about to speak. Uh, but you certainly are welcome to get uh, other food and drink. Where do you find out about Red Emma's happenings? The easiest way is to go to the website, redemmas.org, R-E-D-E-M-M-A-S.org. Go to the About tab so you can learn about our history and philosophy. Go to the events page. There are so many things that we don't have time to mention uh, in total, but I do want to give you at least uh, some things that are coming up next week, even just the titles are exciting enough. On Wednesday, February the 22nd uh, at 7 p.m., Emily Hilliard presents Making Our Future, Visionary Folklore and Everyday Culture in Appalachia. Uh, that is in conversation with Joshua Clark Davis. Again, that is uh, next Wednesday, the 22nd. On Thursday, the following day, Malcolm Harris presents Palo Alto. Any Californians in the house? A few, yeah. Malcolm Harris will be talking about Palo Alto, a history of California, capitalism, and the world. That will be in conversation with Osita and Nuanevu, and that is next Thursday, the 23rd, again at 7 p.m. Then on Friday, here's something fun. We will have the very first dog-themed trivia night. So, so if you know your canines, or if you don't know your canines but want to learn your canines, you should come. Dog theme trivia night with Wiser Ways. That is next Friday uh, at 7 p.m. That's going to be very fun. Again, go to redemmas.org to find out about all of these things because we have plenty. I mean, every week we have uh, excellent events. You want to tell people about them. You want to uh, add us at Red Emmas, hashtag Red Emmas so that the excellent time that you're having this evening, you can send it out and tell the people that you tried to get out the house to come with you, that they should have listened to you to come on down with you. I am so glad that we're having this conversation this evening. Uh, I, from a personal standpoint, as I've moved in recent years from uh, a police reformist standpoint uh, toward an abolitionist standpoint, uh, one of the 
things that I hear talked about and raised a lot with, with uh, understanding. Understandably, this important question is raised uh, of, well, how do we deal with and intervene in domestic violence, all right? And uh, is there not a police force needed to uh, uh, step into situations in which uh, women particularly, in which children are being violated and being attacked. Um, but I believe what our author tonight is going to challenge us with is the fact that the history and the facts of policing, especially recently and more and more, bear witness to the flaws in uh, even that part of what we know as policing in America. Certainly there are well-known cases, Marissa Alexandria, which uh, you touch on in the book, uh, perhaps might be one of the most famous cases, uh, but it seems that it is a regular occurrence of policing in this country uh, that even in terms of intervening uh, in domestic violence issues, uh, instead of helping the situation, those victims uh, get prosecuted and unjustly uh, uh, imprisoned and criminalized. So I think that this is a crucial, important uh, discussion that we are about to have this evening. Lee Goodmark, she pronounced, is the Marjorie Cook Professor of Law and co-director of the Clinical Law Program uh, at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law right here downtown, where she directs the Gender Violence Clinic. Professor Goodmark is author of Decriminalizing Domestic Violence, a balanced policy approach to intimate partner violence and of a troubled marriage, domestic violence and the legal system. Uh, we have copies of both of those uh, in the back as well as tonight's book. We're also very glad to be joined this evening in conversation uh, by, Ro uh, excuse me, Renee Matthews. Renee is an artist and a care management assistant at Johns Hopkins Medical Center and a graduate of Wilberforce University. So there's some HBUs in the house, Wilberforce, Howard. Okay, let's check in for the HBCUs. All right, all right. Uh, important conversation and we're gonna get right into it. Uh, I need you to make some real radical red as noise for presenting imperfect victims, criminalized survivors, and the promise of abolitionist feminism. Make some noise for Lee Goodmark. So um, thanks so much to those of you who came specifically for this. And thanks so much for not leaving to those of you who didn't come specifically <laughs> for this but are still continuing to sit through it. I, I appreciate all of you. Um, and I want to kind of break this up, my part of this anyway, um, into some storytelling um, about myself, about the women that I love, um, and about you actually. Um, and then Renee and I are going to have a bit of a conversation, but I want to set the stage a little bit first. So as analysis said, in 2018, I published a book called Decriminalizing Domestic Violence. Um, that was pretty radical for 2018. Um, people were pretty upset by it, actually. And uh, I was pretty floored at having written that book because I came out of law school at 24. Um, and immediately went into representing victims of violence. And when I came out of law school at 24, I firmly believed that all men, and at that time we were only talking about men, who committed acts of violence were monsters, that they had to be put away, and that the only way that the women that I cared about, that I represented, could be made safe was if they were in prison. I was a prototypical carceral feminist. And I don't use that as an insult. Um, I know some people do. I just use it as a descriptor. A carceral feminist is someone who genuinely believes that the way to deal with particularly gender-based violence is through the operation of the criminal legal system. Right? And that was me. Um, and in 1994, 1995, when I came out of law school and started doing this practice, that was the way that we approached this problem. The Violence Against Women Act is enacted in 1994, and it is a carceral solution to intimate partner violence. As of 2013, about 85% of the funding through the Violence Against Women Act was going to courts and cops and prosecutors. So this is very much a criminal legal system solution, and I believed in it. Very quickly, I learned that my clients didn't believe in it so much. 
So my clients in Washington, D.C. were largely black and Latina women, and they were saying to me on a regular basis, I don't actually want my husband, my partner, to go to prison. I need him. He helps me pay the rent. He helps me parent. I love him. Uh, my religion says this is not appropriate. My community says this is not appropriate. And I started to learn pretty quickly that the options that as a lawyer I could provide to these clients were fairly limited. And as I became a professor and started to really research this stuff, what I learned and what I've written in Decriminalizing Domestic Violence is that the criminal legal system isn't doing the work that we have told people that it's doing that it does not decrease intimate partner violence, that it does not deter intimate partner violence, and in fact, it exacerbates some of the correlates of intimate partner violence, things like trauma. People who have experienced trauma are more likely to perpetrate domestic violence. You send somebody to prison, they are going to be traumatized. Economic distress is highly correlated with the perpetration of intimate partner violence and what happens when you send somebody to prison or even just put them through the criminal legal system in any way, right? An arrest, a probation. They are going to find it more difficult to find and keep employment. Their wages are going to be depressed. All of these things that we are doing in the name of stopping domestic violence are actually making that problem worse. But at the end of decriminalizing domestic violence, I punted, totally punted. Right? So at the end of, de of decrim, I say, decriminalizing domestic violence is unlikely, which I still think, and probably unwise. And so I then give a series of what critical resistance would call reformist reforms, ways that we can tinker around the edges of the criminal legal system but not really change it in any kind of meaningful way. At the same time, I had started to represent criminalized survivors. So back in 2013, when I started at Maryland Law School, uh, they gave me the freedom to kind of create whatever clinic I wanted, which was amazing. Uh, clinical law, by the way, is our law students come in and they represent clients, uh, live, real clients, because just like you don't want a doctor who's never done anything on a human body, you should not ever want a lawyer who's never practiced before they get to you. So my job is to make sure that people like Monica um, are able to practice when they leave law school, that they've had some background with which to do that. So in 2013, uh, Mary Joel Davis, who uh, many of you may know, um, who founded Alternative Directions, then retired, then founded Second Chance for Women, um, which has now become Prepare, um, Mary Joel gave me my first parole case. And I immediately thought, okay, this is the stuff I was supposed to be doing. And year by year, the clinic slowly but surely stopped doing all of the other stuff that we were doing and only represented criminalized survivors. About 2015, I was, do, I was helping Mary Joel facilitate a group of lifers at the Maryland Correctional Institution for Women. Renee was one of the people in that group. Um, and we were looking for a project to do. And I was working with the women on storytelling and we decided we were gonna write a book together. The women would write their narratives and then I would do some framing um, kind of the legal background, the, the research background, and we asked the warden's permission, and the warden gave us her permission to do this project, and then we asked the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services, and they said, absolutely not. You cannot do this project. It is experimentation on incarcerated people, and that is immoral and wrong. And the women who were in that group said to me, write it anyway. We want you to do this anyway. And that's where this book came from. It has been the greatest privilege of my life to do this work. I've worked victim side, I've done work with victims for you know 25 years, 28 years, I guess. And I loved it, I've always loved it. But this work is special. And these people are special. And I still wasn't an abolitionist. So when I started going into the prison on a regular basis, I, I was highly critical. I mean, my work on, was on a trajectory that kind of goes a little bit critical, really critical of the criminal legal system, but I still would not have identified as an abolitionist. It was going into that prison on a regular basis and seeing people who I cared about, who I really loved, who were warm and empathetic and funny and lovely and wonderful living in a cage. 
that made me an abolitionist. And I truly believe that anyone who goes into a prison on a regular basis is profoundly transformed by it, or if they're not, there's something really wrong. Um, it wasn't an easy journey for me to get here, right? Carceral feminist to abolitionist, 28 years. It took me 28 years. Um, and I think it's not been easy for a lot of people in the anti-violence movement because the anti-violence movement is, was founded as more or less a carceral movement. Now, not founded as, that's not fair, because the early anti-violence movement is a grassroots movement. It's the shelter movement. It's doing self-defense. It's community participation. The, the real early anti-violence movement is not that. But kind of the modern anti-violence movement, starting in the late 70s, early 80s, and relying on things like mandatory arrest and greater prostitution, or prostitution, prosecution, that's Freudian, uh, and all of these things, right? That's very much a carceral movement. And it's been hard for the anti-violence movement to shift. It was hard for me to shift. So that's kind of the first story I want to tell. And I tell that story because I think it's important for folks to recognize that we change. And even those of us who come from you know, very middle class backgrounds where we trust the criminal system and we're taught, right, that cops are fine and we're real white and, and real, you know, real cis and real hetero and, and have no reason to not like police or, or prisons, we can change. And I, I should also say, as prisons go, the Maryland Correctional Institution for Women is not the worst. It looks kind of, if you haven't been there, it looks like kind of a rundown community college with razor wire, right? And I still wouldn't want anyone, I don't want anyone to be there at all, ever, right, for any reason. And if that's true of the best of prisons, you can't imagine what the worst of prisons look like unless you have spent time there. And by you, I mean one, not you, because I know some of you probably have spent time there. So that's the first story. That's about how I changed. It's about how I came to write this book. Um, and I think it's important because I want people to know that that change can happen and that even if you're not ready to go all the way to abolition, which in this crowd is probably not even an issue, there are all kinds of things we can do along the way to get us away from this reliance on the criminal legal system and the way that it is harming people like Renee and the people that she was incarcerated with every single day. So that's story one. Second set of stories I want to tell you are about some of the women um, who have been punished by the criminal legal system as a result of their own victimization. And it's interesting that it's not just about people who've been criminal defendants. So for example, Renata Singleton was living in Orleans Parish, Louisiana. And she um, was uh, kind of, her ex-boyfriend took her phone and broke it. And they called the police and the police came and when it came time for the case to go to court, prosecutors came to her and said, you know, we want you to testify. And she said, I don't care about this. I'm not with this guy anymore. I have a new job. I've got kids. I don't have time for this. I'm not doing this. So the prosecutor subpoenaed her, right? They sent her a legal document that says, you got to show up for court. And she went to a friend. The friend said, you weren't really properly subpoenaed. And she said, well, I'm not going. I'm not doing this. Prosecutors went to the court. And they said, she is not showing up pursuant to the subpoena. We want a material witness warrant for her arrest. What a material witness warrant does is it allows the state to lock up somebody who they believe to be a key witness who they can't make a case without until such time as that case gets heard. That could be a day, a week, a month, six months. Depends on when the case gets heard. And so Ms. Singleton then went to see prosecutors and said, I want a lawyer if I'm going to talk to you. And they said, you don't get a lawyer. You're the victim. <laughs> and then they locked her up. And she lo was locked up in Orleans Parish Jail for five days before she was brought into court. When she was brought into court, she was in an orange jumpsuit. She was shackled to everybody else who was being brought into court that day. And she was given a, a bond the first time of $100,000, which, of course, she couldn't make. The next time she was brought into court, the bond was decreased significantly. She was released on bond with an electronic monitor <laughs> until such time as her boyfriend, Vernon Crossley's case came up for trial. You might ask what happened to Mr. Crossley. 
Mr. Crossley was arraigned on the day that he was arrested. He got a lower bond than Miss Singleton did from jump. He made bond that day, left that day, and he pled guilty. So they never needed Miss Singleton's testimony at all. She is a criminalized survivor. She is a victim of violence who was subjected to criminal punishment as a result of her victimization. And material witness warrants happen here in Baltimore City. The state's attorney's office in Baltimore City uses the exact same mechanism to do the exact same thing. Second story I want to tell you is about a woman named Tracy McCarter. Um, Tracy McCarter is a nurse. She uh, lives in New York City. And she had an abusive ex-husband named James Murray. Mr. Murray, when he got drunk, would come around and he would harass her. He would kind of be belligerent and loud. She would get very embarrassed. And so she would let him into the apartment because she was afraid her neighbors would call the cops on her. On this occasion, when she let him in the apartment, he continued to be belligerent. He grabbed her purse. He tried to take money out of it. She told him to stop. And when he was drunk, he was violent and he approached her, and she pulled out a knife to protect herself. He ended up stabbed. Ms. McCarter's a nurse. So she screams, she calls 911, she tries to stop the bleeding, she does whatever she can to save him, but Mr. Murray dies in this incident. And of course, Ms. McCarter is immediately arrested. And then held, and held, and held. And when the, grand, when the prosecutors take the case to the grand jury, they don't tell the grand jury that there's a history of violence here. They don't tell the grand jury that Tracy McCarter has complained about domestic violence on many occasions. What they do say is that there's an incident where Mr. Murray called the police. But what they don't tell the grand jury about that incident was that he was drunk when they got there. There were no physical marks on him. He didn't say that he had been physically injured. And yet prosecutors uh, portrayed that as mutual violence. There was mutual violence. They dismissed Tracy's claims of violence. They said she had never been harmed in any way. Uh, they said that she was angry, like every black woman, right? Um, so angry black women, they're all over this book uh, because every time a prosecutor sees a black woman who defends herself, that makes her angry, right, by definition. She was angry. She was a flight risk because she had worked in Texas and because she had family elsewhere. So they held her on Rikers Island for six months. This is the middle of the COVID pandemic. Tracy could have been working as a nurse, right? But instead, she's sitting on Rikers Island. She's finally released, again, on electronic monitoring. Now, during the campaign for the Manhattan District Attorney, Alvin Bragg, who was running for District Attorney, tweeted out, I stand with Tracy. Survivors of violence should never be criminalized. And yet, when Bragg was elected, his office failed to drop the charges against Tracy. And they continued to pursue those charges. Ultimately, it was two years before the charges got dropped. And prosecutors continued to say, she's not a victim of violence. This is, she's angry. She's belligerent. Um, all of these things. After two years, the charges against Tracy were finally dropped. Tracy's lucky. Because for the vast majority of women like that, those charges don't get dropped. Because Alvin Bragg did, was stupid. You don't tweet something like that unless you intend to follow through on it. Most people wouldn't have done it, and it was really the tweet that allowed public support for Tracy to coalesce around the fact that Bragg had said he would drop this case and then didn't do it. If you don't have that, Tracy's still waiting for her trial. The third story I want to tell you is about Tanisha Williams. Uh, Tanisha was a, had kind of been living on the streets, uh, looking for a place to stay, doing survival sex work. Finally found this guy, Patrick Martin, in Saginaw, Michigan. And Mr. Martin said that she could move into his place. She could stay with him. What she didn't know was that Mr. Martin planned to traffic her. And when she said that she wasn't going to do that, he became incredibly abusive. He threatened her gu with guns. He forced her to take care of his house and his children. And she thought, it's either this or I'm back on the streets. So for now, I'm going to do this. I'm going to stay in this house until I get enough money together that I can get an apartment. I can get out of here. One night, a man named Kevin Amos came to Mr. Martin's apartment. Mr. Martin didn't like the way that Kevin Amos, I forgot. This whole talk's a trigger warning. Sorry, the book's a trigger warning. I'm a walking trigger warning. I'm so sorry. I, I, should, have, I should always say that first, and I always forget. It's about to get worse, which is why I just said that. Um, 
so Mr. Amos comes to the apartment. Patrick Martin doesn't like the way that Mr. Amos is looking at him, and he pistol whips him, punches him, pistol whips him, knocks him out. And then he says to Tanisha, tape his mouth and his nose. And Tanisha freaks out, and she screams, and she says, no, I'm not going to do that. He picks her up by the throat, he throws her into the drywall, breaks the drywall, then puts his arm on her neck, right? Cuts off her airway. When she falls to the ground, he says, get up or lay down. And she knows that what he means by that is, you do what I told you to do, or I'm gonna shoot you too. And so she does it. She wraps his nose in his mouth with tape. Case goes cold for like seven years. And then Tanisha decides she can't live with that, and she wants to give Mr. Amos's family some closure. So she goes to the police, and she tells them what she's done, and she tells them everything that's happened. And she thinks, because I've helped, because I've told the police what happened, because I'm giving them all this information, I'm going to be OK. What Tanisha doesn't know is that even though she acted under duress, somebody forced her to do what she did, Duress is not a defense to homicide. And even though she never would have done that on her own, and even though she was forced to do it by Mr. Martin, who, by the way, agrees with her assessment of that situation, I have an affidavit signed by Mr. Martin that says, I would have killed her if she had not done it. Absolutely, I would have. It's not a defense for her. Tanisha is serving a 20 to 40 year sentence. Uh, she's in the Huron Women's Correctional Center in Michigan. We've asked the governor twice for clemency, asked for her to be uh, released because of the assistance that she gave to the prosecution, and we have had no success so far. These are all criminalized survivors. These are all people who have been punished by the legal system in various ways for crimes related to their own victimization. People come into this system as victims, like Renata Singleton, or witnesses, again, like Renata Singleton. People get criminalized when they go to get protective orders, and the magistrate doesn't like the way they act, so they are uh, incarcerated for contempt of court. Victims get arrested, they get prosecuted, they get convicted, and they get incarcerated every single day. So this system that we built up with the intention of making women safer and I, I'm talking about women, but I, what I mean by women is cis women, trans women, gender non-binary folks, people who are femme identifying, um, trans men, kind of, that's the much broader definition really of criminalized survivor that I use in the book that I took from Survived and Punished in New York. Um, this system though that we built up really for women, let's be honest, has had the unintended consequence in the beginning, and now the very well-known consequence for the last 20 years or so of punishing those women. And yet we continue to rely on it. So we've known about this problem for hundreds of years. Some of you may know the story of Celia. Right? Celia was an enslaved woman in Missouri who was raped repeatedly by her master, and one day after telling his daughters, I'm gonna kill him if he does it again, you gotta keep him away from me, did in fact kill him, burned him in the fireplace, threw his bones out the next day. In Missouri at that time in 1855, juries got an instruction that you could use violence to defend yourself from rape. But Celia couldn't get that jury instruction, the judge wouldn't give that jury instruction because Celia wasn't a person, she was property, and property doesn't get to use violence to defend itself. You know the story of Rosalie Ingram, who was a sharecropper in Georgia, um, and whose two sons tried to prevent her from being raped by the man whose land they were living on. All three of them were sentenced to death, and they were later uh, released from prison after 10 years together. So her 14-year-old, her 16-year-old, and uh, Ms. Ingram all sentenced to death for defending herself. So we've had these stories for, for hundreds of years, right? This country was founded on this problem, and yet it continues to persist. The problem that is baked into the system is the problem of discretion. So you would think there's got to be some fix for this, right? 
There's got to be some way to prevent this from happening. The reason we really can't prevent this from happening is because the system works because the people within it make choices. Police make choices about who to arrest. And there are structures that make those choices run in a particular direction. So for example, mandatory arrest. In the late 60s, early 70s, the police training manuals of the time said, if you come to a scene of domestic violence, don't make an arrest. It's a private matter. Tell the guy, and it was always a guy then, to take a walk around the block, but don't intervene. In response to that, the anti-violence movement lobbied really hard for what are called mandatory arrest laws, to take discretion away from police so that they had to make arrests whenever they had probable cause to do so. And not surprisingly, arrest rates went up after the passage of mandatory arrest laws. And guess who they went up for more than anyone else? Women. women. Not because women had become more violent, but because of the way that police implemented those laws, it is still true today, and it is more true, not surprisingly, for women of color, particularly black and Latina women and native women in some states, than for anyone else. There's a new study out of Connecticut. Uh, black and Latina women make up 25% of Connecticut's population, but 53% of the people arrested for domestic violence under their mandatory arrest laws, right? Not a surprise, not a shock. So discretion of the police about who they arrest, discretion of prosecutors about what cases they take forward and what cases they don't take forward. Prosecutors have more power than anyone in the criminal legal system, more power than judges. Prosecutors get to decide what they're gonna charge, uh, who gets bail, what witnesses they're gonna call, what plea offers they're gonna offer, in the charging decision can predetermine sentencing by charging people with things with long mandatory minimum sentences. And if you get charged with one of those things, of course your, your incentive then is to plead because you don't wanna take the risk that you're gonna end up locked up for that long period of time. You take the plea even if you didn't do it. And criminalized survivors plead all the time. They plead because they wanna get home to their kids. They plead because they don't have the money to do these cases. They plead because they're afraid. They plead because women take responsibility for the stuff that they do. Um, that's what the studies show. I'm not just saying that because I am one, right? That's what the studies show, that criminalized survivors are much more likely to tell you exactly what they did than other people. So lots of reasons women plead. So prosecutors have all this leverage in the system, right? Then judges have discretion. Judges get to decide if there's not a mandatory minimum sentence, what sentence they're gonna impose. And even in states that have implemented laws that allow judges to take domestic violence into consideration in sentencing for, for criminalized survivors, judges decline to use that discretion. So some of you may have heard um, the podcast, which the name of which just went out of my head, shoot. Um, there's a podcast on Apple Music about a woman named Nikki Adamondo in New York. Um, New York has a law called the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act. And what the DVSJA does is it allows a sentencing judge to take domestic violence into account if domestic violence is a contributing factor in the crime, right? If, if it's an important cause to the crime. And in Nikki's case, Nikki has been described as the freaking poster child for the DVSJA. She had been battered by her partner for years. All of the kind of social service agencies in their county knew about her. Child Protective Services knew, the battered women's shelters knew, the police knew. Um, she had pictures that he had posted on Pornhub of her naked and bruised. She had all kinds of evidence, just evidence and evidence and evidence. And yet, the prosecutor in that case contended that she was probably beaten up by one of her other lovers and that she had self-inflicted. Um, but she certainly wasn't abused by her partner who she eventually killed. And the judge basically said the same thing, I don't believe you. I don't believe you were a victim. I'm not, I'm not gonna apply this law. So she was sentenced to a fairly long sentence, goes up on appeal, and on appeal, the Court of Appeals says, oh, no, 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 she's definitely the person who this law was made for, and so we're gonna decrease her sentence to seven and a half years. So the problem we have here, right, is that she's still locked up. She's still being punished. Even when we have laws like this that allow people to use their discretion, allow judges to use their discretion in sentencing, the result is still people end up locked up for things related to their own survival. The book talks a lot about the conditions of incarceration. I don't feel like I have to tell you that incarceration in the United States is unbelievably inhumane on every level, and we can have a conversation about that, and you can certainly, we can talk about that. Um, the book goes on to talk about kind of 
at the back end, the discretion of executives, right, governors and presidents, to use their commutation powers when survivors have been criminalized to decrease those sentences or pardon people, those powers are used incredibly sparingly. In Maryland, for a 20-year period of time, no one, not a single person convicted of life was granted parole because the governors here decided that life meant life. Two, two, three years ago now, the governor came out of the parole process. While more people are coming out, it's certainly not the number that could be coming out. And I know that because I represent, I don't know, <laughs> 50 of them at this point, um, of the lifers at MCIW, right? People who absolutely could come out and the community would be safe. So we have this huge problem. And there have been all kinds of things proposed to fix it, right? You could, there, you could train police again. You could talk to prosecutors. You could have, and this is my favorite one, you could have gender responsive, trauma informed prisons. So gender responsive, by the way, can mean anything from we offer cosmetology as a class to you can be locked up with your kid. That's what's gender responsive, right? And I don't know how you can make something trauma-informed when it is trauma-inducing. Those things are mutually exclusive, yeah. right? So that's not possible. But there are all kinds of these things that, again, critical resistance would call reformist reforms, things that don't get at fundamentally the existence of the criminal legal system, and the legitimacy of that system. And I can't do that anymore. So in that book, Decriminalizing Domestic Violence, that is up there, I'm proud of that book. I feel really strongly about it at a time when not many people in the anti-violence community were saying criminalization is a problem for us. I said that. I took a lot of garbage for saying that. But I'm really disappointed in myself because the end of that book is not what it should have been, and this book is because this is what finally got me to abolition, is working with these women who I love, who I trust, who I know, and who I would have in my house, it, with my children. There's no need for what we're doing. So, even if you're not ready, though, to go all the way to abolition, there are so many things that we can do that are not reformist reforms, right? But that actually get at paring back the way that the criminal legal system has taken over our lives. We can get rid of mandatory arrest. Um, we can get rid of mandatory sentences. We can get rid of cash bail. People don't think about cash bail as a problem for survivors, but cash bail is a huge problem for survivors. Women have less ability to come up with the money that they need to make cash bail, right? We can um, get rid of, there are always attempts to criminalize more things in the name of the safety of violence survivors, right? So the big one right now in the community is criminalizing coercive control. So for those of you who are in the anti-violence community, you know coercive control is the description of the pattern of behaviors that someone can use to limit the liberty and autonomy of their partner. And I'm not saying coercive control is a good thing. It most certainly is not. But criminalizing it will undoubtedly have the outcome of criminalizing more survivors. That will happen. We should not be extending the reach of the criminal legal system in any way. We should get governors to use their clemency powers. We should push them to use their clemency powers. But I firmly believe that we also need to go straight to abolition. That we need to take the $180 billion a year that are going to police and to, and to prisons and redirect that into giving people the things that they need to survive and thrive. If we don't do that, we'll never stop violence in the first instance. We need to be focused on prevention. We need to be focused on creating safer and, and healthier communities and thinking about ways that we can do accountability because we shouldn't leave accountability behind. When people do harm to other people, accountability is important. But the criminal legal system is not the only way we can do accountability. There are so many other choices. And so I believe that abolition feminism, a feminism that rejects the intervention of the carceral state and that says there's a better way to do all of this, is the way that we need to go. And I want to pay the dues that I owe before I turn to Renee, who I promise I'm going to. Um, but I want to pay some dues that I owe. I got here because of the work of Beth Ritchie. 
um, who is compelled to crime and arrested justice are two of the best books written about this subject. They, they are the two best books, I think, written about this subject. Um, and particularly compelled to crime is what started me in thinking about these issues. I owe dues to Angela Y. Davis, whose work I didn't read until much later. I owe dues to Andrea Ritchie, whose work on uh, police violence has been in, uh, absolutely instrumental to my thinking. To Emily Thuma, who's written an amazing history called All Our Trials about the history of the anti-violence movement and the ways in which black women particularly were saying to white women particularly from jump, don't do this. This will be bad for us. This will be bad for our communities. I owe dues to Miriam Kaba, from whom I steal all the time. Um, and you know, particularly because Mar both Miriam and Beth come from the anti-violence community. They come from that work. And they looked at that work and said, why are we doing this this way? This does not make sense, right? Um, I owe dues to all of those thinkers. And more than anybody, I owe dues to my clients. Um, because it wasn't enough for me to have learned it by reading it. It's because they've let me be part of their lives and shared their stories with me and trusted me and allowed me to tell some of those stories that I've come to the place where I am. So with that, there's a, a third thing that I'll talk about at the very end, but I want to turn now to Renee. So uh, Renee, do you want to say hi to everybody and introduce yourself? <laughs> hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Renee. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I'm going to go right into it. Um, I was arrested. Um, I was charged with first degree murder, attempted murder, and a handgun violation. Um, they gave me two life sentences plus five. Um, for the gun? For the gun, yes. So I received two life sentences plus five. Um, Can I just ask you a question right now? Yes. Did you ever hold a gun? No. Did anybody die? No. Okay, keep going. My ex-husband, he's still alive and well. Um, I've been home now for three years. Um, I've been away for 25 years. Um, there's no such thing of day-to-day. -day. How you do day-to-day? -day? After the five years, I don't understand. Um, I was well educated when I went away. Um, I had a five-year-old daughter. Um, she was five. I was 26. Well, next year I'll be 60. Um, the state took 25 of my years. Hmm, I can say my good years, but I, I'm, I'm living my best life now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so, not easy. Um, when I first came home, um, even before I came home, um, a place called the Marion House would come and visit. Wave Marion House. Oh. <laughs> they would come visit at MCIW. Um, I didn't have no um, idea that I would be released. Um, it seems like soon I went in, that's when life meant life. Um, so I thought I was going to die in prison. Um, I didn't want that to be my resting place. Um, that's no place for women. I don't believe for men either, especially with a child, my five-year-old on this end, and I'm on this end, and it's a glass between us because they stop our children from being on our laps, us holding them and touching them. Um, for so many years. Um, when the Marion House came and was interviewing people, I was like, I want to do that. But that was after Leah, Leah program came in. And I was like, I want to do that. Um, but I didn't know how um, or what to do or stand up for myself. How you can tell somebody in prison, I've been charged with a crime that I did not do with two life sentences. Um, I tried it at first when I went away, but the women looked at me like, that's what we all say. I was like, no, 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 I really didn't do this. Um, 
They was like, sure, yeah, 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 okay. Um, I met Leah through Mary Jo in her program, and I asked her to hear me out. Not just listen, but hear. I didn't do what they said I did, and I need you to read my paperwork if it's all possible. I know you got all these cases. Um, can you take mine? Can you look at me? And um, not the number that they put on all our paperwork, but I have a name. And can you just look at my name and at my packet and, and can you help me? Um, she said, yes, right away. I said, yes, Lord, they are angels. Um, they even in this place. Um, between Leah in the Marion house, um, it was like eight years, and the Marion house kept coming in year after year after year, telling me, yes, no matter when you come home, we're going to have a bed for you. And I was like, <laughs> you're going to hold a bed for me? Um, my husband was really abusive. Um, I was young. Um, I didn't know what a relationship looked like because my family was so messed up and dysfunctional. Um, so I had my daughter, and I left her father when I was four months pregnant, so it was just me and her. So then when this handsome, what I thought, tall, handsome man came along, um, should I say devil? I don't know, but <laughs> he was a devil in disguise. Um, and I said, I, yes, I do. I would marry you. The first year was wonderful. It changed quickly um, because I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, they got this idea that um, we talk, um, we arrogant and we cocky, and um, he was trying to break me was his words. Um, he did for a moment. He took that oomph from me that I used to have before I got married. Um, I'm getting it back now since I've been home. I'm getting that oomph back. Um, it haven't been easy, but it is easy. You know, being out here than being in there is totally different. Um, this is my third year now. This April, it'll make me be home for three years. Um, Every day, I just take every day as if it was my last day, you know. Um, I'm getting my relationship back with my daughter. Um, I thank the Marion House every day. Um, I thank Leah and, and her students. Um, they just opened their arms to me. I couldn't believe that Leah was a lawyer at first. I just couldn't believe, you know. You always stay away. I always stay from away from the police or anybody with badges. Even when I see blue cars now, and I'm like, okay. And if they behind me, please keep going. And I'm like, um, but it's not as bad when I first came home, learning the technology, texting, hanging up on folks. Um, <laughs> just a whole new world for real at this age um, and trying to learn that technology my daughter, um, she knows her stuff. Um, I'm just so thankful for her. She worked for Homeland Security, IT tech. I said, ooh, she got that stuff. And then <laughs> look at me, I'm trying to do this, and what is that, and swiping, and I'm still trying to get it right. Um, but it's okay, because I'm on this side trying to get it right. Um, I was telling Leah I was a little late today because I'm moving um, into a one-bedroom apartment. Um, <laughs> and even that makes me nervous um, because they, they still see you as, even though I'm free, but like my credit only starts from when I've been home for the three years, so what happened before then I'm paying for it now, like, I got to pay two deposit and one security deposit. Um, I'm, like, I'm paying to make up for not being on the outside. Um, but I still feel good and I still feel excited about it because um, that's the next journey of my life is um, 
I'm in the Marion house now, so now I'm going from the Marion house and I'm going out on my own, really out on my own in this one bedroom apartment. I'm making it cozy. I just checked it out today and like, this is mine. I like, <laughs> I could go in and come out when I, you know, free will. Uh, I don't have to lock in because they say lock in, you know. Um, it just feels so good just to be here. Even sitting here among you, it just feels so good to just to talk about it or if you see me or if you look at me, um, I try not to look like what I've been through. Um, and I hold that to heart. Um, and, I'm, and, I, and my thing is always to be kind. It's just good to just to be kind to one another. Um, I work at Johns Hopkins Bayview. Um, uh, even with that job, I got nervous. I said, oh, Lord, when they see that background. Um, but I told them everything um, up front because they do go that far back, 25, 30 years. I didn't think. They said, you had nothing to worry about, nay. And I was like, what do you mean? I said, like, yes, yes, I do. They said, well, you only go back like seven or 10 years. To my surprise, everything that I told them, you know, my first attempted charge, the conspiracy, the handgun, they had it right in front of them. And she told me, she said, Miss Matthews, everything that you've spoken is right here. And they gave me a chance. And I was like, thank you, Lord, thank you for this chance. Um, with Johns Hopkins, I can make more than 90 cents a day. What am I gonna do with all this money? <laughs> And it just felt so good. Even um, minimum wage is so much than day wages in prison. It's just, it's just so different um, to come out and to really live. And um, I like for Valentine's Day, um, I love me. Um, and it feels good. I wanna. I just want to pull out a couple of things about Renee's story that I think it's really important for people to understand. So one, the reason I asked that question about whether she had ever touched a handgun and whether she had killed anyone, um, you see a couple of things. Renee was charged with felony murder. Felony murder, for those of you who don't know, is a doctrine that says if someone is killed in the commission of a, a different felony, whether you are the person who killed them or not, whether you had anything to do with the killing or not, you are still responsible. Renee's cousin was actually, it was your cousin, My right? brother. Your brother, your brother, was actually, the, sorry, menopause, um, was actually the person who did anything to her ex-husband. Renee wasn't there. She wasn't involved in it in any way. And still, two life sentences plus five years. Right? So the extremity of the sentencing the fact that people who have nothing to do with violence are sentenced in the same way that people who are directly responsible for violence are things that I want to pull out for you because they're, again, things we could change. We could get rid of felony murder. We'd do it tomorrow if the legislature wanted to do it. Right? Um, another thing I wanted to pull out about Renee's story was how long it took us to get her out. So even though she had an exemplary institutional record, even though no one had died, even though at one point her ex-husband said, I'm fine with her getting out, um, and continued to try to communicate with her while she was incarcerated at various times, it still took us a ridiculous amount of time to get her out. The parole system is fundamentally broken. And that's really, we talk about people who have parole as though you go up the first time you're eligible, which by the way, if it's a life sentence, is 15 years into your sentence, as though people just get out then. But Renee didn't get out then. Um, I didn't talk about Renee in the book because Renee was still incarcerated while I was writing the book, and I didn't talk about any of my clients who were still incarcerated because that was dangerous for them, and that, that's not something I would do. Um, but Irena Pretty, who I do talk about in the book because she was out by the time that the book was coming out, uh, 42 years, also felony murder. She was not even in the premises when the murder was committed. And she was very clearly a victim of violence. 
42 years. Other thing I want to pull out is just to say thank you to Marion House, and there was a reason I asked Marion House to be here tonight. Um, so Gina is here. I, I, you know, Gina Weaver, um, who is the housing director at Marion House, we have been so lucky to have this relationship with them so that when we have people going through the process, the difference that it makes when I can say to the parole commission, she's going to Marion House, it's for them, it's like check done. Okay, housing plan check done, I'm not worried anymore. It's the gold standard. There is nothing like that for men, by the way. There's no, nothing commensurate to that. And they're amazing in that no matter how unexpectedly someone finds themselves coming home, there's a bed. And I, they've never said no. There's an emergency room um, that gets used, if, if nothing else, right? And so to have those kinds of partnerships is essential. There aren't enough of them. And particularly for folks who are elderly and coming out, and let me tell you that I have a number of clients who are over the age of 80 sitting in that prison. The Marion House does job readiness. If you're coming out at 80, that's not what you need. We have no facilities for older incarcerated people. Um, I have no idea what time it is. <laughs> it's eight. So we're just at eight o'clock, and I think that's when we were supposed to take questions. Am I right about that analysis? <laughs> so let me let me just say a couple. Let my my quick finisher um, is I'm going to ask you to do things. Um, I'm going to ask you to do a couple things. One, support criminalized survivors. One of our clients, the last time I was in um, to see her before she was released, said, you know, the thing about having you guys here and having my students there is we felt like everyone forgot us. We feel like no one knows that we're here. We have to let people know that we're here. So we do letter writing campaigns. You can support the Marion House. You can support the organizations that do this work. Support those folks so that they can do this work, right? Push your legislators. There's all kinds of legislation right now that could help our clients who are criminalized survivors, medical parole legislation, geriatric parole legislation. Uh, there's a bill about treating trans folks who are incarcerated with some form of dignity and respect. There's all kinds of legislation out there. Get to know what's out there and do something about it. And then the third thing I'm gonna ask is gonna sound really self-serving, but I promise that it's not. So when Miriam Kaba, who I am, feels wrong to call her a friend. We don't really know each other that well. I, I love her. She knows I exist. Um, when Miriam got her copy of my book, she put it on Twitter. And so, you know, I thanked her on Twitter. Thank you so much. That means so much to me. And then she said, and what are you doing to get it into prisons? And I said, nothing, because I'm a lawyer, not an organizer, and I don't think that way. Miriam very quickly schooled me on how to get this done. So if you are moved to help, there are two ways we could do this. One is there is a GoFundMe set up. If you Google my name and GoFundMe and you feel like donating to get books into prisons, that is enormous. But also, there are books for sale right there. And I realize I, I get like a nickel, by the way. Like, <laughs> I, it's not like I'm making a fortune here. But should you choose to both benefit Red Emma's and help incarcerated people, if you want to buy an extra book and give it to me, I have 13 different prison book projects that I'm working with to try to get books into incarcerated people who've requested them. And I would really, really appreciate your support. So thank you all so much for coming out. We're happy to take questions analysis. You tell me what we're doing. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for giving us plenty to talk about. An absolutely captivating and captivatingly painful description of what's going on. We want to take questions or comments. We ask that uh, you keep them rather truncated and brief. There's so much to unpack. Uh, we need about three more hours to really get into all of it, but we don't have that, unfortunately. So if you have a brief question or comment to, to ask uh, either Lee or Renee or both, uh, just raise your hand. I'll come around with the mic. Of course, always we invite diversity of questioners uh, if we have a number of folks, so you want to keep that in mind. We may have more questions than we have time for because it's such a rich topic, uh, but we will at least try to get in 
a few. So again, if you have uh, a short question or a comment, while people are thinking and raising their hands, uh, Lee, you and I talked about this for a few minutes uh, earlier this evening uh, in terms of the faith community's involvement uh, in this type of accurate and insightful activism. And I'm wondering just what generally have been either responses to the book since it's been out from whatever segment of faith leadership or the faith community or in terms of uh, over the recent years of uh, your approach to this, um, uh, we know that faith community can mean ultra-right, uh, knuckleheaded support of the very things that you're talking about, or it can mean something on the radical left or anything in between. I'm just wondering what your experience with the reaction of faith communities either to, to the book or uh, your activism might, might be. Yeah, I mean, so Marion House, right? That's the faith community in action um, on, on the great side of things. Um, but I also um, have a, an incarcerated woman who I've actually co-written with, um, Juanita Harris, who's quite astounding. If you haven't read Juanita's stuff, if you go to Truth Out, she actually won their memorial essay contest, um, and she's really amazing. And Juanita sends me the stuff that the faith community sends her for the programming that's in the prison. And it's stuff like domestic violence programming. You should have been subservient to your husband and this is why you are where you are now. I mean, that's obviously kind of overblown, but that's really what it is. And so the stuff that gets in, like there's great faith work going on for incarcerated people. There's also really problematic faith work that goes on with incarcerated people. Um, in terms of kind of outside response, not much, but there are organizations that are doing work that is consistent with the work that we're doing, right? So Jews United for Justice is one that I happen to know about just kind of being one. Um, obviously, Marion House is doing faith-based work. We need to be thoughtful about how to work in coalition uh, with folks. I think, you know, the criminalized survivor, so much attention is paid to male to men's incarceration because so many men are incarcerated, right? The bulk of the, the issue is about the mass incarceration of men. But the women don't get the time or, or the focus often that they need. And so, for example, there's all kinds of stuff going on around the um, segregation in Texas prisons right now. Again, I know this from Juanita, who has, by the way, been in segregation for seven years, um, which is a whole other conversation to have about prison, um, but the men are getting all this attention and no one is saying a word about the fact that she has been in segregation for seven years, right? So we need to be better in coalition and I just got way far afield from that question, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think there was a question over here too, Monica. Thank you. Um, I have a question that might be a little bit different from the criminal system, but I believe it's the system that, it's the only system that can bring that down and build an alternative. I'm talking about community. And I am always not sure of what to do whenever there is a claim of sexual harassment. And I find myself between um, having to choose one of the two sides and having to punish someone. While I'm very conscious of the fact that punishing people is not the way to go because the goal is that person itself. So my question is, how would you recommend that we navigate this? And this I know would be different across time, culture, and everything, but how do we believe people who come forward saying, proclaiming that they're victims without fully criminalizing the other person, punishing the other person, and allowing a room, knowing well that in the US, the history, I'm um, not from here, by the way. <laughs> she is, <laughs> and I know, I'm kidding. Um, knowing that the history of like Emmett Tolt, for example, yeah. right? And the uh, Me Too movement, for example, right? But um, like you cannot ask someone to prove that they were sexually harassed, for example. But at the same time, I cannot just believe you for the mere fact that you're a woman, because it means I am redefining gender roles in a really problematic way. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I think that's really complicated. Um, and I, I think where you started is where I would start, which is around community. So there are, um, there's amazing work going on around the ideas of community accountability, transformative justice, restorative justice as one small part of that. The question you're asking is a more fundamental one, which is like, when we say believe women, should we really believe women all the time? Um, and I think you know, that's something that a lot of us grapple with. Um, and I'm not sure there's a good answer to your question, except to say that when I approach new clients, new people who are telling me their stories, I try to approach those stories from a place of belief um, in that first instance to get to know that person, to draw that story out, to build rapport with them, to hear what they have to say. And then I try to figure out, okay, so then is that belief justified, right? What is the external that they can give me? But I can also tell you, I have to work on faith a lot of the time because as somebody who does anti-violence work, the vast majority of my clients, it's even, so there are very few people call the police, very few people get medical records, there aren't always photographs, um, it's oftentimes somebody's word versus somebody's word, and I just have to kind of be okay with that. I'm never, I wasn't in that room. I can't tell exactly what happened. I'm never going to know exactly what happened. And everyone's story is different based on their perspective and their experiences and everything that they bring to that situation, right? So I, my students know I assign them this uh, Japanese story called In a Grove, which became the movie Rashomon. And it's all about the different perspectives that people have of the same event. So you might have somebody who says, I was sexually harassed, and the person who did that might not perceive that in that way at all. Right? And so kind of using community processes to try to help people have conversations so that people who've been harmed can have can say to the people who did them harm, you know, why did you do this and what did you mean by it and what is it, kind of, how do we rectify it and how do we get to a place where that's not, doesn't feel that same way, I think is the way to do that work. But it's labor intensive and it's time intensive and it's resource intensive. Um, and it's much easier just to lock somebody up. And so we have to be willing as a community to say we're going to put our time into that. I think the other thing that I get asked a lot of is about community, right? So if you live in a community that is, ascribes to those gender norms, is um, misogynistic, um, is homophobic, is you know, um, transphobic, and you are harmed, how do you go to that community for help? And I think we have to think differently about what we mean by community. And we don't necessarily mean geographic community, but we can mean the communities that we create together in spaces like this, and we can mean online communities, and we can mean communities of faith in all kinds of other places that will actually allow us to do that kind of intervention in a sensitive way and a healing way. But it takes a lot of work. There's not an easy answer to that. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you, Renee, for it's too close to your microphone. I can just uh, for, for sharing your story. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think she is uh, Professor Dickhart. She is my professor, and I would be too. <laughs> um, she was said, I think that um, the incarceration of the victim was an unintended consequence of the system. And I was like, is it unintended or? Not anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So I think. So the question was, yeah, the question was, I said it was an unintended, that the criminalization of survival is an unintended consequence. I think what I said was, initially it was an unintended consequence. It has gone on for far too long now for us to call it an unintended consequence. We know exactly what the consequence is gonna be of using this system and we continue to do it. So I would not call it an unintended consequence now. I do think that if you went back to 1979 and said to the anti-violence feminists of that time, hey, this is gonna result in a bunch of women getting locked up, the black women would have said to you, yes, we just told you that, but the white women maybe would have seen it differently had they known it was coming, right? And I, I think that's why you're starting to see people shift. You know, you're seeing anti-violence organizations put Black Lives Matter signs outside and have police try to get them defunded. And you're seeing domestic violence coalitions signing on to letters that say, we recognize the harm that we've caused here, and there is backlash to that. But people are taking those stances anyway because they do recognize the harm that we've done.
And I say we because I was part of that harm. Like, I don't try to distance myself from that in any way. I was absolutely part of that movement. Hi. Um, I am wondering if you can talk a little bit more about coercive control. Um, there's currently a bill before the Maryland legislature regarding codifying co coercive control. And can you just discuss how that could lead to more imperfect victims, more people, more um, victims being cr um, criminalized and incarcerated? So again, coercive control is the use of a suite of behaviors, including isolation, including economic control, emotional abuse, financial abuse, and physical abuse and sexual abuse to limit someone's liberty or autonomy. So you see already that that covers a lot more ground than our traditional definitions of domestic violence. And right now, the things that are criminalized are really just physical abuse, right? Emotional abuse isn't criminal. Uh, economic abuse isn't criminal. So if we criminalize that entire suite of behaviors, we're talking about a whole lot more people who might be finding their way into the criminal legal system. And because it includes emotional abuse, it's so easy to misuse it against survivors. She nagged me. She followed me. She checked my phone. She Right? All of those things, they're absolutely going to be brought to bear against survivors. I don't like to trade in stereotypes, but what often does happen is that the person who is primarily responsible for the harm is a lot more equipped to tell their story than the person who is being harmed. That person who has experienced trauma, who may have traumatic reactions to talking to police or prosecutors or others, who may have emotional responses to doing that work, or who, who may have flat affect because they've just so much to be dealing with, right? All of those trauma responses make you a terrible witness. And so if police are asking you and your partner who's responsible for this harm, and you no longer need any kind of visible manifestation of harm because it's emotional abuse, that is going to be used against victims of violence on the regular. It's going to happen. Hi. Obviously, I'm a fan, and I've seen through the first book. Um, one of the things- yeah, Shanna was around for the first book, true. so I, she's I also saw the visceral from the first book. <laughs> Um, which is partially towards my question. Um, with the transformative nature of your views on things and coming towards abolition, do you feel any responsibility sort of to rise the tide or bring people along with you? Yes. And with that, how have you responded? Because I do remember the visceral with the first book. So what Shan's alluding to is, it, in the, the first book is actually pretty mild um, when you compare it to this. But it really did challenge a lot of what the anti-violence movement held pretty dear. And the backlash was pretty extreme. Um, and people were very, very angry with me. And I didn't understand that for a lot of anti-violence feminists, creating that criminal legal system was their life's work. It was what they, it was their mission. It was the way that I feel about this work is how they felt about that work. To have somebody tell them that it was hurting the people that they meant to help was a big problem for folks. And I didn't expect that, right? The second book came out, one, the title is enough that I knew I was gonna get flack, but also it's further along that road. And yeah, I do feel a responsibility to bring people along with me because I do, that's why I start this talk with that story, right? I, I want people to see that you don't have to start from woke. Um, if that's not a ridiculous cliche, and I've just proven I'm now a 53-year-old white woman because I just used that word. But like, you don't have to start from that place. You could start somewhere very different and get to abolition. And you can get there because you listen to the people that you work with, and you read, and you learn, and you expand. And I want to bring people with me. But I also want to create space for people who aren't quite there to come this far, right? to get rid of mandatory arrest, to get rid of felony murder, to get rid of uh, long mandatory minimum sentences. Those are things you could do without having to be fully an abolitionist. And I also want to acknowledge abolition requires a leap of faith that some folks aren't quite ready to make. 
And, you know, nobody's asked it yet, so I'll just ask it for you. Like, what do you do with the really dangerous people, right? And there's a whole conversation to be had about that, and all I would do is quote Mariam Kaba because I just steal from her on that because it's much better than trying to do it myself. Um, but there is that leap of faith that not everybody's quite ready for. But we can get close, right? And we can do all the things along the way. And I think that's important, too. So I'm trying to make it so that people can, wherever they are in this place, do those things, those concrete things. Um, thank you both for being here. Um, I, so I am a trauma therapist at our local rape crisis center here in Baltimore. So all the people I serve are um, survivors of intimate partner violence, human trafficking, sexual violence, and I consider myself an abolitionist, like those are my, you know, core, at my core, my political beliefs. And I hear every day, you know, from my clients about the ways in which they are criminalized by our so-called justice system. Um, I hear all the ways that their experiences in the criminal legal system create or exacerbate the abuses and traumas that they've been through. Um, and at the same time, you know, I'm gonna go to work tomorrow and I'm gonna talk with people about how to get a protective order. Um, I'm gonna talk to people about their rights within this system that I also, you know, then will like process the harms that that system does, right, when you have to go in front of a magistrate and uh, prove your victimization. Um, or be told that the ways that you protected yourself and survived are crimes. And so I guess my question is sort of, I feel like you know there's things we can do to move individual hearts and minds. There's things we can do at like sort of the big, like macro policy level. But at the end of the day, these places where people are told to go to get services when they experience these harms that were funded through this you know anti-violence movement that you spoke so much about, like how do we engage that level of the system? How do we create different um, responses, different possibilities, different mechanisms for protection? And, and we can say like the answer is community accountability and restorative justice, like we can say all those things, but at the end of the day, a lot of people don't have those communities, right? They don't, they don't have um, a community that has the resources and capacity to uh, provide protection or accountability for harm doers. So I guess I'm just curious, you know, it seems like you're in conversation a lot, right, with that level, and how do you, how do you engage that level and how do you create possibility there? Yeah, I think that's, so I teach my students something called client-centered lawyering. The idea of client-centered lawyering is that lawyers and clients are partners in a process that help clients to find the solutions that work for them. and. For some clients, the solution is I want to go to the criminal legal system. I want to get a protective order. And that is absolutely their call. And if that's the call, I'm going to go with them. And I'm going to do everything that I can as a lawyer who has an understanding of that system and some power within it to try to make that system as responsive for them as I can, to try to push judges to do the right thing, to try to push prosecutors to do what my client wants them to do, whether I believe that it's a useful thing or not, um, to try to push others in that system. I am not, though, particularly optimistic about our ability to change those folks. I, just to be 100% honest, my job was to train judges for three years when I was pretty young. Um, and judges who want to change will change, and judges who don't want to change won't. We've been training cops for 40 years on this stuff, and they still don't do it any better. So. I fully accept that this is the system we've got and we're gonna be stuck with it for a while and as long as we continue to only provide this system, which is really all we provide to, to, to victims of, of, to survivors of intimate partner violence, right? This is what we give people. I will do whatever I can to make it better, but I don't have a lot of faith that we can do that. And that's because on a fundamental level, the system is doing exactly what it was designed to do. 
It is policing and controlling the behavior of people who fail to conform to its standards. And I completely failed to talk about the reason this book is called Imperfect Victims is because there is a narrative about what a perfect victim is supposed to look like. And we know what that narrative is. That is a white, straight, middle class, cisgender, meek, weak, passive woman. And if you fail to conform to any of those stereotypes, you're not gonna get help. And even, well, so yeah, and I mean, and there's like, there's even a conversation to be had about kind of what do we even mean by white at this point? Because if you are of lower socioeconomic status, if you are rough in some way, if you're a substance user, if you have mental health issues, if you're a sex worker, if you've done anything that makes you less than perfect, the system is not gonna be responsive to you. And I just don't have faith that we can make that system responsive, I truly don't. That being said, I'm still a lawyer. I still go into that system. And at the end of the day, at least, at the very least, if my clients understand what's going to happen and feel like they had somebody who validated them and who tried to get them what they needed in that system and gave them some kind of voice, then I've done what I can do, right? I can't control, I'm trying not to use any of the adjectives that are in my head right now, the judges. I can't control the prosecutors, but I can make sure that my client feels heard and validated, right? That's what I can do. And it's not a satisfying response because the system can't be fixed, it's doing what it's meant to do. Take two more questions and then, uh uh, we have a couple things to close with, and we'll give a final round of applause. Hi, thank you, Renee, for being here. Your You're warmth welcome. and presence is just so fortunate to be around it, because I felt it so much as you were talking. I was looking over at the table with Marion's house, and the woman there was looking at you with such love, and I was like, oh, we need a group hug right now. Um, but I am currently a law student at University of Baltimore, and I'm in the Innocence Project Clinic, so all the trigger words, client-centered lawyering, and we work with wrongful convictions as well. And it is so frustrating being in the system. Um, when we talk about whether or not there's such a thing as progressive prosecutors, I don't think so, um, because it's hard. And even when you were talking about Renee charges, like that's what happens is they stack all of these charges on before you even go for sentencing, and so the odds are already against you when you even try to go in with any bargaining power with these plea deals. It's a whole lot. But um, the podcast you're talking about is Believe Her. Thank it's you. It's very good. I am the talking head <laughs> on that podcast. I just couldn't remember what it was called. Um, and there's a website called fiscalnote.com to go to for your legislators. You type in your address, and you can type your message in right there. I always talk about that because it's AI, AI, and it's super easy to do. Um, it's F-I-S-C-A-L note.com. Um, but my question is about, we, you mentioned trauma-informed, and I love when you say like a, tra a trauma-inducing institution cannot be trauma-informed. Like, duh, like it's like going into prisons, you just, everyone should go into a prison, honestly. Um, because, I mean, well, not everyone, but if you are someone of a lot of privilege, you should because you automatically, there's just no way you can rock out of there unaffected. Um, when we're on the other side, though, dealing with our clients, a lot of the times I'm just worried that uh, when, even in the institution that where we're learning, we're not becoming trauma-informed lawyers. Yeah. And so we're honestly harming our clients. Um, and so I just love to hear your perspective on how maybe we can, like, obviously the remedy is, like, getting some of the people out of the institution, <laughs> replacing them with better professors. Um, but just how can we approach trauma-informed lawyering so we make sure when we're helping our clients and really trying to get them the best outcome as possible that we can do that in a truly client-centered way? Yeah. Um, I, I think law schools should be teaching trauma-informed lawyering. We certainly do in our clinic. Um, we spend a lot of time talking and thinking about you know, how does trauma operate, where does it come from, how your clients may be experiencing it, how it affects your relationship with your client, how it affects your client's memory, how it affects their ability to do what the system is asking them to do. Like in a parole hearing, they're basically, the first part of a parole hearing is dredging up your worst nightmare and making you talk about it again. And then you're supposed to then represent yourself in the best possible way. Like, it's crazy, right? So we spend a lot of time talking about trauma-informed lawyering. 
the other piece of it that we talk about a lot these days is self-care uh, because you can't be a good lawyer for people who have experienced harm if you are burnt out yourself it keeps you from being able to have the capacity to do that so it's not just about the client's experience of trauma it's also about the secondary traumatization that can happen by repeated exposure to this work I think law schools are doing a much better, so when I went to law school, we didn't hear the word trauma, um, and I did work with victims of domestic violence, and that word never was said. So I think we're in a much better place than we were, and I know that clinical program, because I taught in it for 11 years, um, and so I know that there are people there who are doing that work and doing it well, um, including Erica, who is a goddess. Um, but I do think we need to think about infusing it into other parts of the curriculum so that when you're taking a class on count client counseling, you're learning about trauma. And when I'm teaching you family law, I'm talking to you about trauma and about the way that's playing out in these cases in the courthouse. Right? One of the things that law school, I think, doesn't do as well as it could is to tie law school to the actual practice of law. Um, the more that we do that, the more that there's room to do what you're talking about. Last question. I wanted to build off the last two questions. Um, I work as a public defender. I, I most recently work as the supervisor at the Eastside District Court, which is the DV court uh, in Baltimore City. Um, and, and I'm listening to some law students here and some other system actors. And, and I guess my question is, is there a role for those of us with an abolitionist mindset uh, that are system actors? Or are we simply giving legitimacy to the system with our presence? We gotta be there. As long as this system is the way that, that people are being dealt with, those of us who have this orientation and have these beliefs, we gotta be there. We gotta be pushing on the system at every turn. Um, one of the things I've talked to OPD about is kind of how we can use some of the research about the way that criminalization perpetuates violence in bail hearings um, and in sentencing to talk about kind of, look, there is this research that says when you traumatize people and then you don't do anything with that, they're gonna come out more violent. Is that really what you want in this case? When you take this guy's livelihood away, if he comes back out, that's likely to make him more violent. Is that really what you're trying to accomplish here? Because I think there's room to push in a way, and we have to be there. We can't not, and I don't think, you know, I would love to live in a world where we could just say, well, I don't want the system to exist, so it doesn't. But then Renee is still incarcerated. And then you know the clients who we are in there trying to get out desperately, and the ones you're trying to keep out, they're stuck. So I think we have to be there. As long as this system exists, we got to be there doing this work, but we got to push this work um, in every way that we can. And I think, and we've got to continue to think about you know, how do we maximize our ability to bring these ideas to people who don't have them in ways big and small? But yes, keep being a public defender. <laughs> I want to uh, lift up Out for Justice. Unfortunately, MJ Sutton could not join us as planned this evening, but I want to you, make Renee. everyone aware of their website, which is Out numeral for justice.org out the numeral for justice.org all right uh, and just to give you a brief idea they call the three e's engage formerly incarcerated individuals families and friends the grassroots outreach and community events educate our member base and communities on the policies and practices impacting our communities and and navigating the legislative process for reform empower those impacted by the criminal legal system to utilize, utilize their voices and experiences to enact tangible change. So they could not be here tonight, but unfortunately, uh, fortunately their website is available out numeral for justice. I want to also invite Toby Morris of Marion House just for a, a quick minute to give a brief overview of Marion House. We've already talked about the, the important work that you all involved in. Uh, but just kind of a, a brief greeting from Marion House, an intro, and uh, see you have materials here. Uh, we talked about the faith response uh, and engagement in these matters. Uh, Toby and I, Toby is one of my oldest friends. We go back to church days growing up as kids, and then we were also co-workers, co-educators in the 90s. Uh, so I'm so glad to see her here, but uh, just a kind of a brief uh, word from Marion House.
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it is an honor and pleasure to be here tonight, and it is also an honor and pleasure to represent Marion House. Um, I've only been with Marion House for a few short years. I mean, for a year, 15 months today, actually. Um, <laughs> but what I want to say is that my very first introduction to Marion House, even before I was employed, was with an imperfect victim. And one you spoke about here tonight, who had been incarcerated for 40, 40 years? 42. 42 years. And when I met her, it was her first holiday outside of prison walls in 42 years. And that's when I really began to understand the incredible work of Marion House and how, and, and since that day, 15 months ago, I have met many women with the help of Gina, our, who does an incredible job making sure our women are housed and prepared and get all the therapy that they need. This is a huge part of the work that we do. And we do provide safe and a sober living environment for women, many who are coming out who are unjustly incarcerated for a long time, like Renee. And um, we are able to do the work that we do with people who share in our passion and understand our vision that um, returning women to, to independence is, is our priority. It's our mission, it's our value, and it's our priority. And some of those women, many of those women, have come out of um, really unjust situations. And um, I was crying as you, were giving your, as you were giving your testimony, Renee, because, and that happens a lot at our work. I mean, I'm probably, some of us are crybabies there, and it's perfectly fine. Um, but we cry because it is so unjust what is happening and we, we need your support. We need your support to do this work, to make sure that when women come, for, and some of them when they tell me their stories, they're like, you know, they said I should come to Marion House. They said I should come to Marion House. Um, uh, Jessa, uh, House of Corrections, uh, what's, what's the right? Maryland Correctional Institution for Women. Maryland Correctional Institution for Women really works hard to get women into safe places when they come out of that, for that housing plan. And many women speak about their housing plan. And Marion, Pla Marion House is one of the places that is a part of many women's plans because they know that we've been doing this work for 40 years. We're not gonna stop. Our model works and we really do help women get back on their feet and go from um, what we call our transitional program where they get therapy and medical advice and IDs and all those things. I mean, Renee has told you what they need and then they go on to a community living and then they go on to get their own apartment. It is an incredible program and if you have any questions or you want to talk about it, we do virtual tours every month, every other month. Our next tour is April. 12th, you can go onto our website, and we'd love to have any of you incredibly impassioned people to join us in this work, so thank you. <laughs>